Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be talking all about the gut-brain axis. This is hugely critically important, particularly if you suffer from irritable bowel syndrome, SIBO, and oftentimes even things like GERD and IBD. I am so excited to begin this crash course with the gut-brain axis as a whole, and then in further videos, we're gonna dissect the vagus nerve, the sympathetic nervous system response, and most importantly, ways that you can balance the system and bring it into harmony so that your gut can finally function again. This is going to be impactful if you have dysmotility, bloating, poor digestion, low stomach acid, high stomach acid, reflux, you name it. I'm so excited for this series. Let's get started. And of course, per the usual on this channel, we wouldn't be able to talk about any system of the body without going over a little bit about how it all comes together, the anatomy, and what we're exactly looking at. So let's start off with a little bit of a neurology crash course. Again, I've drawn my classic ugly doodles for you, but here we have the brain, which I will refer to as the cortex. So this is the wrinkly part of the brain. This is like the frontal lobes, the temporal lobes, the occipital lobes. These are the parts of the brain that we really think of when we think of the brain. So we've got the cortex up here, the cerebellum, that's the part of your nervous system that is primarily in control of things like balance and coordination and motor planning. Then we have the brain stem from about here to here, which is broken up into three parts. We've got the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. The spinal cord, which starts at the base of the brain stem and then goes all the way down to about mid or lower back. And then a lot of neurons come out of that and go out to the body. And then here we have the pineal gland, which we're gonna talk about momentarily, but that is part of this, this structure that we're gonna talk about as far as the gut-brain axis. We're gonna talk about the pituitary and it's BFF forever, the hypothalamus. And then over here on the other side of the drawing board, I've got the gut. So just a little depiction of the stomach, the gallbladder and liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the intestines, the colon, all of the things that we've talked about in depth on this channel. And then we're zooming in a bit and you can see these are the enterocytes. So these are the cells of the gut wall. When we talk about healing leaky gut, this is the section that we're talking about these cells that make up that nice picket fence and separate you from your microbes. This is the gut wall that we're talking about. And then you have two muscular layers. You've got one that's kind of coming at us out of the whiteboard and another with the muscle fibers go longitudinally along the, the length of the whiteboard. So this is if we hyper zoomed in on one section of the small intestine. And now that we have the anatomy out of the way, we can talk about some of how this is all connected. So like I said, going back to the nervous system here, we're gonna focus in a lot on two primary areas as it pertains to the gut-brain axis. You've got, again, your pituitary, which has an anterior posterior lobe. And then there's a little section just above the pituitary, which is called the hypothalamus. And this is the part of your nervous system that is primarily in control of the autonomic nervous system, which is largely what we're talking about today. So it's that part of the nervous system that regulates bodily functions and secretions totally on autopilot. You have no conscious awareness and no conscious control of any of the stuff we're gonna be talking about today. So the hypothalamus is in charge of that and via its connections with the pituitary, it's the part of the nervous system that regulates the endocrine system or your hormones. So for example, you have the hypothalamus that's gonna secrete thyrotropin releasing hormone that tells the pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, and then thyroid stimulating hormone tells the thyroid, hey man, make more juice. And your thyroid should respond by making T4 and T3. So all of that signaling starts at the level of the hypothalamus and then via the pituitary, it tells that gland, the thyroid, what it needs to do. The same thing happens with the ovaries and the testes and the adrenal glands, a lot of that, that cascade of hormones ends up coming from the pituitary and the hypothalamus first, and then those signals tell the glands what to do. But that's not the main focus that we're gonna focus in on today. Instead, I'm just going to make mention that the hypothalamus really seems to be the part of the brain that is mostly in control of the autonomic nervous system. That's where a lot of the signals come from. And what we'll focus on here is the vagal nerve nuclei, of which there is an anterior and a posterior nuclei on the right and the left side. And then the vagus nerve is going to make up the biggest part of the rest and digest side of the nervous system. So if you wanna think of it almost like a yang yang scenario, right? You need both. 
You need both darkness and light. You need both fight or flight and rest and digest. It's not that one is good and one is evil. If you were constantly stuck in rest and digest, relax at chill out mode, you would be in big, big trouble if you were to encounter a mugger or a rapist or a lion or something that needs your immediate attention and you need to survive. You would not survive if you didn't have fight or flight. But where fight, flight, freeze, appease, which I think is the best way to think about the one side, where fight, flight, freeze, appease, the sympathetic side of the nervous system is useful in some scenarios. You don't want to be stuck in that part of your nervous system and you don't want that to be overly dominant all day, every day of your life. Rather, you want the rest and digest or the parasympathetic You want that parasympathetic part of your nervous system to be present and active and doing its job when you're eating your food or sleeping or relaxing or living your day-to-day -day life. So both are good, both are valuable. It's just that I find a lot of people, myself included, honestly, are chronically stuck in the state of fight, flight, freeze, appease, and we're not as skilled at getting our nervous systems into that rest and digest space. But these are both parts. Both of these together are the autonomic nervous system. And they are part of this gut brain axis that we're gonna be talking about. Because again, you don't have conscious control over this. You can't sit there right now and think, okay, make stomach acid, no! It just, it doesn't work. Or you can't sit there and think, all right, secrete bile right now. Like you, you don't have that control. If you do, you are supremely talented and I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. But let's get back to the anatomy. So the autonomic nervous system has the two main branches. You've got fight, flight, freeze, appease, and rest and digest. For people tuning into this channel, watching this video, you probably are in a state where you want more of this, right? And the rest and digest parasympathetic part of your nervous system is mostly going to encompass the vagus nerve. And that's what we'll start out by focusing on. So you have the vagal nerve nuclei over here. And those vagal nuclei house the cell bodies, they house the actual nuclei and, and bulk of the neurons, and then their projections will go out of those nuclei and come down here to the gut where they're usually gonna synapse with some of the deeper layers of the nervous system in the gut, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. Similarly, and you can kind of imagine, you know, a connection. I don't know if it's a direct connection. I'm not so savvy with my neuroanatomy anymore that I remember the exact connections, but there's some control coming from the hypothalamus, influence the vagal nerve nuclei and the sympathetics. hypothalamus. Similarly, you have sympathetic fibers. Most of those fibers are going to live in the sympathetic chain, which actually hangs out alongside the spinal cord. And then those neurons, they're going to start up higher as well. And then those are also going to come down here and influence the effect of the enteric nervous system. So we have two two things coming down from the central nervous system, that is the brain, the spinal cord, and the brain stem. Those are the parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers. Mostly we're talking about the vagus nerve and the sympathetic fibers. And those are kind of like this yang yang scenario, this balance where when one is hyperactive or more active, it suppresses the activity of the other one. You can't have both functioning at the same time. You really need to, you alter that based on what your brain perceives around you. If your brain is perceiving a threat, notice I'm not saying if there is a threat. I'm saying if your brain perceives a threat, if your body perceives a threat, whether it's there or not, so that could be physical threat, emotional threat, lack of sleep, lack of nutrients, whatever it might be. If you perceive a threat, you're gonna to tend to have this sympathetic predominant state. 
if you are totally chill, totally cool, you feel loved and secured and happy and connected and like all hippy dippy and wonderful, then you're gonna be more able to tap into that vagal nerve rest and digest state. But let's zoom in down here. So now we've had, we have the parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers coming down into the gut. And now there's two parts of the enteric nervous system local in the gut that I wanted to make mention of. So in between these muscle fibers or in between the muscles and the gut lining itself, we can see that there's a submucosal plexus. So imagine, you know, something like this. Just draw some neurons hanging out and branching and chilling and talking to each other. So you've got some neurons down here. This is the submucosal plexus. I'll just put SM because I don't feel like writing it out right now. And then up here, you have another network of neurons that are all synapsing and talking to each other and having a grand old time. And then, hold on. There. So the submucosal plexus is one layer. And then the myenteric plexus, which I'll just put M for short, is the other layer. And both of these are very important, but they're doing different things. And what's cool about this is that both of these chunks, so the submucosal plexus and the myenteric plexus in between the muscle layers, those are the enteric nervous system. And those are, A, they're gonna receive stimulation and receive input from higher up centers, so the sympathetic and parasympathetic. But to some extent, they're able to act on autopilot and work together as a totally separate unit. So if you were to disconnect your brain and your gut entirely, some function could be preserved for a period of time because you have this, they call them short reflexes, where these nerves will feel stretch, for example, after you've eaten a meal or if you're really bloated. Those, some of those neurons will sense stretching of the intestines and then they will respond by either contracting or relaxing the muscles. So you have a sensory stimuli and then that impacts a function or the tone of a muscle or the tone of the intestines. So some of this is going to be entirely closed circuit, local in the intestines, and some of it is going to be influenced by the gut-brain axis and the, the vagal nerve, the sympathetic fibers, and the hypothalamus. So you have a little bit of a mix of both. What I have observed here, and actually I'm gonna, let's see, there. I would say these two together are the enteric nervous system. These two together are the autonomic nervous system. Well, I guess we could lump that in as well. And that is basically the control that we're looking at from the top down. Of note also, I will just share, this will be a, a better video for another time. The vagus nerve that everybody talks about as far as controlling motility and the gut-brain axis, the vagus nerve does have downward control over the gut. But the vast majority of what the vagus nerve does is it actually takes sensory information from the gut and brings it back up to the brain. So all of the sensations of pain, stretching, pooping, motility, whatever it might be, all of those sensations and all of the metabolites from your gut microbiome are hitching a ride on the vagus nerve and bringing that information to the brain. So the vagus nerve is actually about 80% going from the gut up to the brain and only about 20% working from the brain down to the gut. That being said, I will just tell you my clinical observations working quite a lot with the gut-brain axis because I work with people with SIBO and IBS. What I've noticed is that if we can focus primarily on the vagus nerve and primarily on the balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic and getting your body to a place where it feels comfortable and safe enough to digest your food, that oftentimes is miraculously healing for IBS and SIBO and poor motility and bloating and things of that nature. It's just a matter of how we tap into that, which we'll talk about in future videos. But working from this angle that we have a little bit more of a deep understanding about usually does the trick. Usually I'm not getting too lost in the weeds with my patients at least, talking about the enteric nervous system. I'm more so thinking that that's gonna regulate itself if you give it the right input and if the information coming from higher centers, namely the hypothalamus, the vagus nerve, and the sympathetic nervous system, if we could regulate these things to whatever degree possible, 
usually the enteric nervous system seems to be responsive to that. So yes, it can be on autopilot to some extent and it can kind of contain itself in the gut and function on its own, but it does seem to be very responsive to any sort of work we can direct at the autonomic nervous system or the hypothalamus. So I tend to see the gut-brain axis conversation more from a lens of parasympathetic sympathetic tone and the balance between the two. I usually don't end up talking about this piece of it quite a lot with my patients, but I'm very well aware of it and I know about the neurology, I know the relevance of it. And for what it's worth, I will share the myenteric plexus, the one that's situated between the nerve or the muscle fibers, is more so in charge of regulating motility. And the submucosal plexus is going to be more so in charge of regulating secretions, things like mucus, telling the goblet cells to secrete mucus, telling the uh, enteroendocrine cells to release their peptides, and interacting with the gut microbiome and the gut wall. So for submucosal, you could think more about the gut lining and the mucus and the microbes. For the myenteric plexus, it's a little bit more in control of those muscles, their tone, their function, their contraction. But both of these systems are gonna get information from the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic, and the sympathetic nervous system. So really a lot of it boils down to working on the balance between those two worlds. Thanks guys for tuning in. I hope that this crash course gives you a good foundation for starting the journey on healing IBS or SIBO or whatever might ail you. There's a lot of complex neurology, but hopefully this boiled it down into what you need to know. Again, the big takeaway is the balance between rest and digest and fight, flight, freeze, appease are the two, that's the biggest thing that you can work on. The two halves of that seesaw or that yin and yang scenario. Don't get too lost in the weeds worrying about these different plexuses. I just wanted to share the entire gut brain axis from beginning to end so that you have a complete view. And now in future videos, we're gonna talk quite a lot more about how you can go about facilitating vagal nerve tone and activation and how you can go about balancing that rest and digest, fight, flight, freeze, appease side of your nervous system. So stay tuned in future videos. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.